consent can be revoked at any time. Any time. If you're in the middle of having sex with somebody, you can you can revoke that consent right there and then, and that stops right there. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We always strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy and positive approach to non-monogamy. However, everyone approaches this a little differently, and at its core, our show is about hearing and learning from different experiences and approaches people have. With that in mind, it's important to remember that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily represent those of our own. It's also important to remember that we aren't doctors or therapists and that we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on this show. We should also let you know that this podcast will hopefully include some explicit language. So, if that kind of thing offends you, you should probably keep listening until it no longer does. If you're under 18, we'd suggest finding a different show or gather up your parents and listen as a family. Enjoy! We're going... Ooh, we're live and I hiccuped. Always, always something. <laughs> Welcome to episode 36. We're Finn and Emma, like always. And today we have an interview with... Why are you looking at me like that? They can't tell. It's a podcast. <laughs> I know. You're giving me side eye here. Yeah, I'm giving you side eye. <laughs> today we have an interview with Simon that ho- who hosts the A Slut Podcast. Yeah, it's a fairly new podcast out of New Zealand. And so... We brought him on to share his thoughts about non-monogamy, BDSM, um, specifically polyamory. I've got those way out of order. So anyway. (laughs) It doesn't matter the order. We talk about everything. uh, We do. And before we get to that, we just want to remind people, if you love the show and you ever think you might want to come on or just chat with us sometime, reach out, say hi. We're always around. We're always writing emails back to people. Um... We never send dick pics, so you're not going to get any surprise dick pics. Nope. And reach out to us. If you're thinking, man, I'd love to get an STD check, but I don't know the best way to do it. I thought I was supposed to be doing that. But I'm teaching you. (laughs) What makes you think that you're so good at it? I just, I'm just giving you some examples. Okay. Okay. Let's see what you got. That if you're thinking you want to, but you're like, oh, I don't know how to do it. You just go to normalizingnonmonogamy.com slash test, and boom, you've got links to stdcheck.com. You save 10 bucks, and it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Good ad. I know. Okay, what's next? Oh, Cassidy, the best online dating site for meeting other open-minded couples and people. Uh Uh-huh. Also, you can go to our website, the show notes. And find links to get yourself a free 30-day trial. That's about all we got. And then we should... You can also extend it to 90 days. Don't forget that part. Yeah, if you leave us a review on iTunes. But it's got to be a nice review. We don't want any mean ones. We have <laughs> Please. One, we have one mean one. It's pretty funny. I know. <laughs> anyway, so go do those things. And we will see everybody in one hour on the other side of this And interview. if you want to find us on Twitter or Cassidy, you can find us under the screen name NNM Podcast. And our website is normalizing non monogamy. You already mentioned that. Okay, anyway. (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) Hi, Simon. Thanks for joining us. I know it's, uh, we're recording this early in the morning here where we're at and very late or later at night where you're at. So thanks for staying up late and uh, taking some time to interview um, or have us interview you. Yeah, not not a worry at all. Thanks for thanks for having me on. It's kind of exciting being able to get onto other people's podcasts as well. So yeah, so so you just started a podcast not not too far back, I guess. Maybe before we dive in too deep, do you mind telling people a little bit about what it's about? Yeah. So and you guys noted on this quite early on is that the the description for it is quite vague and quite open-ended. So it's called the A Slut Podcast, and that stands for Advice, Sex, Love, Understanding, and Trust, where the premise of it is I interview people and basically just have a talk about sex, relationships, all of that kind of stuff, um, polyamory, swinging, monogamous relationships, all, all sorts, and basically just to normalize conversation around sex as well and to educate around sex. My big thing at the moment is around changing the thought of consent in schools. 
So, for example, we're telling a lot of young ladies how to avoid getting raped instead of teaching the young men not to do it. Right. Yeah. And it's that sh- that that shift in thought pattern is something that I that I want to do, and I want to get into schools and large corporations and run seminars on this kind of thing. So, yeah, that's that's the general premise of it. Yeah. Do you have and, a back- and, and a little oh, bit more? And a little bit more. Sorry. No. Go ahead. So, do you have a background in sexual education? I don't. Um, I am very. I'm more. I'm polyamorous. I'm very much a kingster, which is laden with a whole bunch of, of consent on that side of things. Um, so it's more on experience at this point. I call myself a an unofficial sex educator or an, an uneducated sex educator, I guess. <laughs> Which well, does, sound like, it does sound like a contradiction in terms, but it's probably the easiest way to explain how I feel about myself at this point. Right. So how how did you end up getting into all of that and starting to go down this road to begin with? Fantastic question. I was I was listening to a lot of podcasts actually, so that's the reason I started the podcast. Um, and it was really good on the way. And the culture in New Zealand, like I said, is very much around the teaching young girls not to or how not to be raped as opposed to or, or sexually assaulted or whatever. Jeez, we've gone deep really early, haven't we? Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> we just we just go right into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, instead of teaching these young boys what aggressive behaviour could be or how the things that they uh, say can affect women or the things that they do can affect women in a negative way and they don't even realise it. But yeah. the one example that I've, u- that I've used many times now is we had a game called Catch and Kiss. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, no, but I... I... It seems fairly self-descriptive, but maybe... Be... Yeah, so, so it's kind of like tag, right? You know, the game tag. Yeah. But when you catch when you catch the person, you give them a kiss. And it's usually the boys chasing girls, right? You can you can see where I'm going this and how this can be problematic in a male psyche. Yeah. It's that, that it gets into their psyche that, okay, if I just keep chasing them and chasing them and chasing them, I can do whatever I want with them. Right. Which is the premise of catch and kiss. You catch a girl, you kiss. It doesn't mean she necessarily wants it but you've caught it so you get it and it's little things like that that can potentially be quite dangerous later on in life right yeah that and seems like yeah. that would not be good to teach kids to do <laughs> exactly exactly and that's my point and like i grew up in australia i live in new zealand now and uh, but they're both quite similar in that regard so the game that i learned was in australia but i do know they played here as well and Teachers just watch it and think that's innocent fun, but if you actually delve into it, it can be quite worrying in the long term. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I guess what types of things, what what was the shift in your mindset, you know, and when did that happen for you that, hey, maybe this isn't the way we should be doing things? And Yeah. So my, my big one was actually the Me Too movement. Oh, okay. Yeah. And... The, in New Zealand, we had a male version of it as well, which was a little bit different in that a lot of males came out and said, actually, I've done these things to make a woman feel uncomfortable or, or you know, yeah, to what could be considered a light form of sexual assault. And I sat there and went, shit, that is bad. Am I allowed to swear on this, by the way? Uh, uh, no, yeah. yeah, it's no problem at all. <laughs> yeah. just, just making sure some people don't like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I was going through all of these guys that were saying these things, and I went, "Shit, there's a lot of guys doing this. Um, I've done these things as well. I kind of need to change what the hell I'm doing so I can be a better person." And part of it was also getting involved with the kink scene here as well. I learned a lot through of consent and what is good and bad when it comes to how you act around people. Because there was also a lot of feminists in that group, which helped me out through that process as well. Okay. So between all of these different sort of, well, I don't want to say things, but influences is the word. All yeah. of these different influences has helped me change my perspective on it, and then move on to try and teach other people yes. through my podcast, through eventually, hopefully, schools and seminars, and that's excuse me, and that sort of thing. <laughs> So it sounds like it's been pretty recent then that you, I know you just started the podcast recently, but I, um, 
that you've thought about doing all of this. That's really exciting. Yeah, so the, the Me Too movement started here about probably three years ago or so. Yeah. And that's when I really made the big sort of realisation side of things. And, I mean, the podcast has been going two and a half, three months now. I'm up to episode nine has just been released. And this will be a while ago when you guys put it out. But, yeah, so it's it's still relatively new and I'm enjoying the conversations that I'm having. Uh, it's it's really cool that people are willing to open up to me about it as well. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a truly important thing in this day and age to be able to open up about, you know, even, even if it's just vanilla sex and talking about someone's sexual life and what they enjoy, what they don't enjoy, I think that makes a big difference in, in normalising sex and not making it such a taboo subject to talk about. And then with sex becoming a less taboo subject, sexual abuse might then become less taboo because it's affiliated with it. Right. I think a lot of people are ashamed that they've been abused or something like that, so they don't talk about it because sex in general is such a big taboo, for lack of a better term. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, well, I mean, I think we can both say thank you for, for creating that show. and Yeah, definitely. And then I, I wondered if maybe can you take us through your journey on the personal side of maybe how you got into kink and and then what, what your relationship sort of model or what your philosophy looks like and and then also a little more about maybe who you are as a person. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with who I am as a person first, I guess. So <laughs> I'm, I'm 28. So it seems we've got through all the heavy stuff. Let's make it a little bit lighter. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I'm 28. Um, I am currently a single, uh, technically pansexual, but I call bisexual. I'm very open to people of all genders. And, yeah, so I'm currently single, pansexual, polyamorous person. And it's the first time since I've been polyamorous that I've actually been single. So it's a it's a bit of an interesting experience uh, for me at the moment. Obviously, I, I run my podcast, the Aslap podcast. I also work about 65 hours a week on top of that, um, right. running an electronics store and helping small businesses build themselves as well. Wow. And, yeah, so I, I have a an absolute potato of a dog. Called Brutus, he's an English bulldog, <laughs> and, and I live in this little small island called New Zealand. And that's yeah, that's me. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I mean, I think that's it, it's important for people to hear too that you know you're you're balancing possibly multiple relationships on top of it sounds like one really really busy job and another one that's that's up and coming and growing. So I think. That's something that people can appreciate, the amount of work and effort you're putting in it. Yeah, <laughs> and it's really exciting, too. Uh, my, my life is almost organized down to a minute at this point with my, <laughs> with my Google Calendar at all times. I'm not going to lie. But the thing is, I don't have multiple relationships at the moment, obviously, because I'm just – I'm still single, which is – like I said, it's kind of strange for me because it's the first time I've been single since I've been in the non-monogamy sort of circles. But – I'm beginning to realize that I'm talking to more people than I'm, now that I'm not into a relationship. Okay. Um, I'm getting to know people more and I'm forming almost like an initial bond of a relationship, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So not, not uh, obviously it's a friendship sort of thing, but there's uh, a romantic aspect to it still as well. So, yeah, it's it's kind of strange trying to trying to work my way through that kind of thing at the moment where I'm not – actively dating multiple people but i'm just hanging out and seeing where it goes because i've only been single for three months or so okay i wanted and to it's, yeah I, was, I wanted to back up a little bit do you mind telling everyone like how i guess how did you start getting into polyamory in the beginning and what did that look like for you yeah sure um so i first got into polyamory a couple of years ago and it was purely because <laughs> of a of a person that i got into a relationship with Okay. A lovely woman that I got into a relationship with at the time. Yeah, she was polyamorous, and it was part of the terms of us getting together that she that we would continue to be that way, and she would continue to be that way. And then it came uh, while I was thinking about that. Obviously, I didn't say yes or no at the time because it was it's kind of a completely different thing for me at the time. Yeah, I was like, hey, did you know about polyamory, or had you heard of it before? Yeah, 
Okay. Yeah, because it was we were already in the kink scene, and the kink scene here is very much linked to polyamory. Ah, okay. Um, the yeah, so our our poly meetups have a lot of kink people, and vice versa. So obviously, you've still got your separate ones completely, but yeah, they they are relatively linked uh, where I live. So from that point, I thought about it and thought about it, and then I actually thought about it logically, which is what made me turn over to to polyamory the whole time. And the, the logical thought was there's 7 billion people on the planet, right? 7 billion. And you want to find that one person who satisfies all of your needs, wants, and desires while you satisfy all of theirs. And you've got that chemistry there. Right. That's that's an, that's an astronomical odds, right? Yes. It's huge, huge <laughs> odds. So the, thought, the next thought then for me was why not get a couple of people that can satisfy different parts? that fulfill me in a different way while I fulfill theirs in a different way to potentially their partners. So the, the, I guess the, the polyamory practice that I probably most identify with is relationship anarchy, I guess. Uh-huh. Like my, my partners can go off and date other people. I can date other people. There's no real set boundaries on it unless I feel one of my partners is unsafe with somebody else. And then I'll sit down and I'll have that conversation with them. And and we go from there. But I'm not going to sit there and say, I guess what some people say, unicorn hunter and go, okay, you're only allowed to be with us and that's it. That's not that's not my style. I'm very much about free love and that side of things. Yeah. And how, how long ago did you make that shift from the the kinks BDSM side of things into the into the poly side of things? And has the your approach to it shifted over time or did you pretty much start off with the relationship anarchy model? It was pretty much started off like that because uh, my, my partner at the time was, like, she was my submissive at the time, so it was still in the kink side of things, but I didn't put any boundaries on her personal relationships with others because that was part of our dynamic and it was fine. And that sort of lent itself to that dynamic of, of anarchy where I would date others as well, and I would also um, have kink play with others as well as, as her, and even her included as part of those scenes with others, and vice versa, and and all sorts of things like that. So it was it was pretty much instantaneous. Um, it was what felt most comfortable to us at that time. So we just sort of went with it, I guess, and it's it's been like that for me ever since because that's what I feel most comfortable with. And that was a was that a couple of years back. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That was about two, maybe two and a half years ago. Okay. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds sort of like you have had experiences where you've been with with multiple partners at the same time, possibly in this at the same like literally physically at the same time. Do you do you yeah. see any parallels or any blending between what what you do in polyamory and kink to relating it to like the swinging side of things or do you do you still feel that they're pretty yeah. separate uh, no i don't feel that they're, that they're separate at all because i mean poly and swingers are always going to be quite uh, relatively close when you have the conversation around non monogamy so like I've, I've been to swing parties with with some of my exes while i was with them and we had no issues with that we were we definitely all got involved with each other as well sexually which I don't see that as swinging because we are all in, in a relationship with each other still. Sure. But it, it's definitely more to a swinging side than what a lot of other polyamorous situations are. So it's kind of that middle-ish kind of ground because we did go to swingers parties as a group of like four at times or a group of five at times and just went and had fun. So there's definitely a swinging aspect to it still. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... Sounds like a fun night. Yeah, sounds like a blast. <laughs> yeah. It definitely is. There was plenty of orgies to be had. <laughs> so what what got you into the kink side of things back at the beginning? Um, I'll be honest, it was porn. Um, you, you, your porn um, sort of elevates from a basic basic standpoint. It went from there and I went, sort of went, hey, I'm actually kind of interested in this. And from there I got onto a website called FetLife. Okay, yeah. Which is all around fetishes and kinks and all of that sort of stuff. There's that in New Zealand there's actually a lot of swingers on there as well. 
um, because it's we don't have anything like Cassidy or Red Hot Pie or anything like that. So generally, it's Fet Life that's used for it. Um, so this was ooh, probably almost ten years ago now, actually, maybe even a little bit more that I that I started getting into it. So I signed up to Fet Life and. I didn't really pay too much attention to it. I went off and had my regular sex and all of that sort of stuff and, you know, did the whole spanking thing, you know, what what I would now call probably vanilla-ish kind of kinky sex. Yeah. And, that, and then there came a point probably about four years ago, excuse me, where I realised that kink and sex didn't have to be linked. You could easily have a kink scene without any sex involved. And that's when I started to get a little bit harder a little bit darker, I guess, for lack of a better term, <laughs> and and a little bit maybe more intense might be the best way to put it. And I got into a lot more, a lot more different things. Like one of my big things now is uh, playing around with electro toys and electricity and things like that, which is funny because I work, I run an ele- uh, an electronic shop. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the so the kink side of things has, has evolved and grown and but you mm. at the same time you you've peeled off the sex side of things. Do you, I think I think a lot of people might have a hard time understanding yeah. that. Do you, do you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah. So I, I don't actually have sex a lot now, but I did a lot of that during my teenage years and um, well into triple figures. It's not funny. Um, but the I get a different kind of feeling with sex than I do with kink. Um, kink's a big release of endorphins. It's also the care of somebody, and so, not even just the care of somebody, but somebody giving you giving you their submission, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So them yeah. off, offering it up to you and trusting you enough to give that to you that you won't go too hard or too fast, or you know that you've got their best interests in mind. And one of my big things has always been you leave somebody in a better place than you found them, and that's the way that I took it into my kink as well, is that you push their boundaries and you push them, but you never overstep. And that sort of thought of this person's ended up better after this is a great feeling. The the relationships you, that you gain is uh, really, really close because obviously you're doing things that can actually damage you physically and even sometimes mentally as well. So... The, the thought that that person's entrusting you with all of this stuff is such a huge thing, and I don't think you get that as much from sex. You get the endorphins still from sex, but you don't get that thought of this person has given me this trust to to do these things to me. Right. Yeah. No. For sure. I think I think that makes a lot of sense, and and I think I, again we're we're not really into the kink community, but I would imagine that. The conversations around consent that that you've talked about earlier in the show, and that and that we see happening a lot on the the swinging mm-hmm. side of things, I imagine those are just as important, if if not more important, yeah. on the on the kids <laughs> sure. side of things. <laughs> yeah, guess, yeah, yeah. The, the the consent side is is absolutely huge. I practice enthusiastic consent only, um, so they've got to be really really into what you want to do. It's not just oh yeah you can do that or yeah, if you want to. That's one of the most dangerous things I've ever heard is, yeah, we can do that if you want to. Yeah, yeah I, that does not work. That's, in, that's instantly a no for me because it can go down so many paths that, it, that are just wrong. So it's got to be enthusiastic. Before I play with anybody in a kink sense, and this might seem over the top to, to anybody listening and to you guys as well, I have a 13-page checklist of things. It, it'll just list a whole bunch of, of kinky acts, and then it'll say, again, to try or no thanks and a comment box. And they've got to fill that out before I play with them so I know what they want to get out of it, what they do want to do, what they don't want to do, basically, you know, draws the line there, yeah. right? And then I've got another nine-page form, which is more around the, the whole consent side of things and what the relationship is actually going to be because you've got a dominant submissive relationship or you've got a top and bottom which is slightly different so a ds is more emotional and it goes on outside of just a scene or a party or something like that whereas a top and bottom it's a little bit more detached 
Right. So it works, it works through that side of things as well, um, whether, whether they can be willing to help clean up after a scene, all, all sorts of different things. So that's a bit more in-depth of the people involved as opposed to just here's a bunch of acts, do you like them or do you not? Yeah, and it sounds like so you both, you are generally the dominant or the top, correct? Yeah, so I'm a switch. Okay. But it takes somebody very, very special to top me or to be a dominant to me. Okay. And the, the, reason, the reason for that is I started as a dominant. I learned my trade as a dominant over a long period of time. I met somebody quite fantastic, and I allowed them to, to be my dominant for, for a while. And part of my reasoning around that also was to learn more about the submissive side so I could be a better dominant. Yeah. I think that sounds... I mean, that's really interesting, and I think your approach to... I know somebody coming into it might see your forms and your questionnaires and everything as a little bit tedious, but at the same time, you're... Uh, you're needing to learn a lot about that person before you're willing to go to oh, certain yeah. places with somebody. So I think that's amazing that you're taking that step. Well, and, and, on, yeah, the, the, and on the flip side, I would imagine it helps make that person feel more comfortable exactly. knowing that that yeah. you've put that much thought and care into their well-being. Yeah, uh, and I hope that's the way that it comes across. I understand that it can be quite daunting especially for people who want to do it sort of um, off the cuff or on instinct, I guess, to, to have to go through this sort of stuff instead of just picking up a person and going, hey, can you show me this? I will do that on occasion uh, at a play party or something. Somebody comes up and goes, hey, can you please try this while it wanted on me? I haven't tried it before. Times like that, I will do it, but it will only be to a low level right. To, right. to ensure what is going on is, excuse me, is all about board. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very, very careful about about that side of thing. If it's something that I would like to continue further, then there's there's no discussion around it. That has to be done. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. I, I, I think people do appreciate it. I do think new people find it tedious. Um, I've had that response a couple of times where they say it's, you know, you've got... 21 pages worth of stuff here, 22 pages worth of stuff. It, it's a lot to get through. I'm like, yeah, but do you want to be safe while we're doing this? Or do you want something to uh, have a higher likelihood of something going wrong and injuring yourself? Especially yeah. like, especially with my main kink, which is, like I said, playing with electricity and electro sort of stuff. There's a whole bunch of different things that can go wrong with that. You've got electricity coursing through your body. You know, there's a lot of things, a lot of safety things that can go wrong here. And you need to, I need to know that you're up for it. You need to know that I know what I'm doing as well. So this needs to be done. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I guess that, that, that maybe brings up the question, are are you often playing in the king side of things with people who you're not in relationships with? Or I guess because you said I right have, now you're not in a relationship and, and maybe... Uh, on the flip side, do all of your relationships in recent times involve the kink side of things, or or do you still keep those separate at times? I definitely still keep those separate at times. Um, most of my relationships have been still kinky, and I'm not in relationships with everybody that I play with. Um, so I've answered all of those quick fire there, but we'll go into depth now with them. The, the first one, yeah, the... The fact that not all of the people I get in relationships with are kinky brings myself back to you get different things from different people, which is why I got into polyamory in the first place. So I'll have one or two that have different kind of kinks, and they do that thing. And then I've got one who is potentially more of a, of a sensual side of things as opposed to a, a violent side, I guess. And, yeah, so that's the main thing around that. Um, the other part of that is I'm not in a relationship with everybody I play with, right? Um, it's kind of impossible to be, especially because <laughs> yeah. I was I, I was looked to as, and still kind of am, um, a senior of our King community, even though I'm still quite young. I've been around for a fair while and I'm trusted in, in what I do. 
So I would have a lot of people new to King come up to me and ask, hey, can I try this with you? Or, you know, who do you know that knows about this? Or, you know, questions of the like. And I can't sit there and go, okay, I need to be in a relationship with you before I show you. It's That's just a little bit odd and weird, I think. Right, um, yeah. You want to impart some wisdom and some and teach somebody things right. too. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's for me. Yeah, as as long as there's, it's either like, and to be honest, I've had a lot of a lot of um, scenes scenes at parties that have involved people that I'm not in relationship with. We've been in kinky relationships for a while, not well, play partners for a while. But I also count play partners as not really a relationship, but it is a relationship as well because you still need to be quite close to know what you're doing and have those open forms of contact that sometimes you can't get. So it's almost like you're acting as a relationship, as being in a relationship when you're not, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, that does make sense. Uh, I want I want to circle back to the, the consent side of things. I know, you know, yeah. one, one thing that's important is to maintain, and you mentioned the, um, the, the saying, yeah, sure. If you want to try that, I'll try that, you know, but I imagine there's times too where, and and this happens in monogamous relationships and non-monogamous relationships where you start off saying, yeah, yeah, no, I want to do this. And then throughout the next, however, you know, long, whatever the amount of time is, the, the mentality shifts, but they don't ever verbalize like, Oh, I'm, I've stopped having fun or I'm not having as much fun. What are, mm-hmm. what are some ways that, that you watch or, or how you, you monitor for that? And, and maybe if you can tie that into how people who are doing swinging or just, you know, monitoring their own relationship yeah. can, can watch for those yeah. signs of, yeah, the consent's still there, but the enthusiasm has has waned. Yeah, sure. So the the, the first thing is anytime I'm I'm playing with somebody, whether I play with them a hundred times or play with playing with them for the first time, I always negotiate exactly what's going to be done. It's kind of a psychological reading, I guess, for lack of a better term, and reading responses from that point, which is something I'm I'm lucky to be very very good at. I can gauge people's responses quite well through their, the way that their body language is being, the way that the, their face reacts to, to what you're saying. So I, I read people quite well. So it's kind of difficult for me to give any tips when it's sort of a natural thing for me. But the main thing that I want to put into this is that consent can be revoked at any time. Any time. If you're in the middle of having sex with somebody, you can, you can revoke that consent right there and then and that stops right there. So for people who potentially aren't feeling like they're into it so much anymore or are noticing that they're maybe not as enthusiastic as they once were, you can say that. It's okay for for you to say, yeah, this is not for me at the moment. Even if it's just a one-off, okay, it's not for me at the moment or you don't want to do it anymore. Just speak up. Hey, I'm not into this anymore. Can we not do that, please? And that should be enough. Even if you're in the middle of what's happening, say I'm giving somebody spanking and and they say the safe word, then it, that's it. You know, it's mm-hmm. still in the middle of the act. It's still in the middle of the act, but that's where you stop. Within kink myself, we I use even in the middle of a scene a traffic light system. Okay. So so yellow is slow down. I need a break. Something like that, or not so hard. Red is complete stop, scene ends after care straight away. So that that's that sort of ties into being able to know where the other person's at and that side of things. It's a bit different when you're in a bit of a long term relationship, I think. In that something that you've been doing for such a long time and it's difficult for the other person to speak up and say that hey, I don't want to do this anymore and then it's also in part the responsibility of the other person in that relationship to sit there and go, hey, are you still actually into this? And sometimes it's tough to pick up on on the signs, like I said, but you should be keeping in touch regularly about what each other are feeling and talking about your sex lives and talking about the relationships that you have at any given moment just to see, basically catch up with where the other person's at, I guess. You should be doing that regularly, I think. 
Yeah, no, I, I think I think we agree with that as well. I, I guess Definitely. one thing I, I would say is that it's it can be very difficult if you are in the middle of something and you do want to revoke consent. I mean, it, it can be a, a terrifying thing to do. Yeah. And I would I would yeah. double down on that and say, especially if you're a woman and and unfortunately mm-hmm. there's there's men out there who aren't going to want to stop doing that. And unfortunately that, that, that can turn into a very negative situation really quick. Do you, do you have any advice or any strategies you've seen from maybe other people in your community that, the ways that they have developed to, to navigate that and to get out of those situations safely and, and confidently. So we also use a lot of safety calls as well. So at some point throughout the evening, you'll get somebody else to call you just to check in that you're all right as well. If they don't, then they'll send somebody in or, or come and pick you up themselves so that you give them the address, the phone, call, the phone number, the name of the person, that sort of thing. And that's just because anything can happen with any person at any time. So there's always good to have a backup plan there. Yeah. While it, while, while it's happening, though, is, is can be quite difficult, obviously, especially if the other person is a lot more physically strong than what you are. That can turn it very, very difficult, at which point whoever's doing it is, is just an asshole, basically, and <laughs> you, you basically just got to fight then at that point, which really, really sucks, and I, I don't really have a lot of, a lot of um, recourse for that. Uh, not, not a lot that I can really think of that you could do, except if the person's not stopping what they're doing, then you're going to the police like as soon as you finish because that's fun. Yeah. Have you had people revoke consent in the middle of your scenes? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely I have. And I stop straight away and the first thing I do is give them a hug because the aftercare needed, especially when it comes to kink sort of stuff, is sometimes needed instantly. And sometimes it's a couple of days later, so you've got to keep in touch with them and, and keep talking to them and see where they're at, see where their head's at. Yeah. So, yeah, it has happened to me, but it's been, it's about being mature enough to realise that it's probably not your fault and it's certainly not the person you're with's fault and just stop at that point and do what you need to do from there. Yeah. I think you did note, too, that uh, a scene doesn't necessarily end when you leave this this i guess the physical location and it it is Mm -hmm. important to check in with people a couple of days later and keep that line of communication open um kind of goes a little bit along the lines of consent and just also respect for for each other Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely that and that that's one thing that i didn't realize until i really got into the scene here is about aftercare and what can happen even a couple of days later. You know, I thought you go and you do what you need to do and you give them hugs afterwards for however long they need it. I didn't realise the potential psychological effects that happened two or three days after when all of those endorphins have gone and all of that adrenaline has disappeared out of your body. You can actually get really quite low and to, to the point of depression at times because you've had this awesome high, this huge high, there's going to be, it's like um, where every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And it's the same sort of thing with the human body. If you've got a high, then there's going to be a low. And yeah, le- le- learning that was one of the big lessons that, that I had. Because um, I didn't do it my first time uh, after joining the scene. And people went, what the, what the hell are you doing? You know, this person needs you. And I was like, oh, I did it on the night. And they're like, no, it doesn't work that way. It can happen, you know, a week later. Yeah. I'm like, oh crap! I'm I'm gonna go talk to them and, and see what's up and apologize because that that's wrong. So there has to be that level of mutual respect for each other as well. And but even you do it with friends though, don't you? As well, you if if you've seen a friend one day, a couple of days later, you tend to send them a text message and go, "Hey, everything's sweet, you know? How are you? Yeah, just, a just general checking in, quick uh-huh. catch in the Yeah, exactly." So if you do it with friends, why are you not doing it with people that you're potentially, like, well, for example, one scene was feeding somebody to a pop so they're bruising 
all over the body. You know, if you're going to do it with a friend, why wouldn't you do it to, to this person that you've spent an hour flogging and whipping and whatnot? Right. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it takes an extra level of of awareness on the on the person who's in that dom or the yeah the dominant role because mm-hmm. I think on the submissive side it's it's and and again I haven't been there but I would imagine it's not as easy to advocate for yourself when you feel like you leave a scene and that person had this control over you mm-hmm. you you don't have the capability to reach back out to them and say that hey I need I need some reassurance that everything's yeah. you know that 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 I still have respect from you right absolutely absolutely because yeah sometimes sometimes yeah like one of my heavy scenes she could not talk for about two hours afterwards oh, just wow. physically couldn't talk it was really really heavy and she did amazingly well at the time it was really phenomenal um, it was actually kind of theatrical because I was dressed up as the Phantom of the Opera and we went through all the Phantom of the Opera songs. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, but, yeah, she couldn't talk for, for about two hours afterwards. So it was certainly my responsibility at that point to realise that and make sure I did my duty in aftercare as a dominant of, of, in that situation. It's hugely important to, to realise your responsibilities because you're playing with somebody's body, you're playing with somebody's mind. And and their and their brain waves. So you need to know what you're getting into and and what you need to do afterwards. It's your responsibility to do it. It's not. It is partly still on the submissive as well. It's not all on the dom to go. Hey, you need this now. Sometimes the submissive can say it as well. But I think a lot of a lot of um, not pressure, but a lot of the responsibility falls on the dominant for that. Yeah. You know, we've talked a yeah. lot of, a lot about consent and a lot about the BDSM and kink communities. If there's people, listeners out there that are interested in in getting into the BDSM or kink or at least exploring it a little bit, do you have any tips mm-hmm. for how they would do that, um, I guess, safely and navigating the consent realm of that at the very beginning when you yeah. maybe not don't know how to do it? Yeah, Absolutely. Um, the, the main thing is make sure you have a clear and concise negotiation with the person that you want, that you potentially want to play with. Even if you put it out on writing with a line down the middle and going, things that are okay, things that are not okay, and and work from that point. And that that's my big thing. And my first few times, I always had it in writing purely so that there was a reference point. There was not a, hey, you said this was okay when it wasn't. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I think that's a hugely important part. Also, take your time if you're just entering the scene. Take your time getting to know people and getting to know friends of people. And you can actually ask for references in the king scene as well to, to for somebody to prove that this is a person who is safe to play with. So feel free to ask that question as well. Basically, ask as many questions as you can. And um, if some if some answers don't sit right with you, then don't do it. Yeah, you're not you're not forced to do this sort of stuff. So th- those would be my my main ones for that. I think. I think I think the references piece is a really good point to make because that's something that you may not think of right away, but that yeah. is definitely something that is welcome and good to do. I would think and it would make you feel, at least if I were entering the scene, it would make me feel safer knowing that I could talk to other people about this person that's going to do something to yeah. me or with me uh, and and get some buy-off that it's a mm. good situation. And this, this is why for a long time I only played with people in the scene so I could get um, like in, active in the local scene, I should say. It's so I could get, I could talk to other people in the community and go, hey, what do you think of this person? What do I, What should I know about this person? Um, because, and, and this is the biggest problem with, with newbies and people who are dangerous will sit there and go, I don't have any limits. That is uh, scary question number two. I've already said one scary question, but this is scary question. Uh, scary statement number two is I don't have any limits. If somebody says that, I am running out the door as fast as I can <laughs> because it, there's just too many things that can go wrong as part of that. 
So the, the other thing that I'd like to add to that in talking to other people and around the references sort of thing is if you're only talking to one person and going through them and, you know, you, they become a mentor or, or whatever to you, it can get quite dangerous if you're not talking to other people and getting their advice on it. Um, the, the example I use as part of that is Anakin Skywalker and Senator Palpatine. I don't know if you guys are Star Wars fans. but <laughs> We have some An- movies. Anakin's, yeah, so Anakin follows Senator Palpatine the whole way and thinks he's doing everything right. He thinks he's on the good side the whole time because he's following this person who's, who's in charge. And it turns out he's quite obviously on the dark side of it. And that can happen in kink as well if you're following and learning from just one person is that they may not be all that they cracked up to be and they may actually be a negative influence as opposed to a positive one. So that's why I say talk to as many people as you can, get as many references or talk to people about other people as much as you can as well, just purely for safety's sake. Yeah, it's all about getting getting perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say too, I think it would be it would be fantastic if that reference system was uh, was something in the the I don't want to say standard, but in the the mainstream dating world where you could go to a bar and before you go home with somebody mm. or or start a relationship with them, you can get four to five references of past <laughs> yeah, people to make that, sure or friends of them. That, that, yeah. That'd be ideal. That'd be ideal. But I, I think most relationships are started through friends of friends nowadays, anyway, though, aren't they? Yeah. I think you get that more than than a bar. And yeah, although, although the, the 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 world of dating apps has has grown, I think maybe there should be a a review system in place. As well, like... On the on the dating app, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. That, that, but <laughs> that, that that would put that would put a lot of fuckboys out of business. I think. <laughs> Yeah, that could be pretty rough for some people, which would be good yeah. because if people are being shitty, then they deserve to be called out for it. <laughs> yep, I agree. I hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. So maybe one of one of the things we have been asking on the non monogamy side, just when we've talked to people who aren't in the kink scene, is yeah, about sure. uh, bloopers or something funny that's happened to them, just to kind of help. I guess again normalize it to realize that things don't always go perfect and that sometimes there's moments that are just outrageous. And I, I guess we'd maybe be interested to hear one or two from the, the kink side of things because I imagine people hear a kink and they think, well, everything is super serious and dark and heavy, but I imagine there's some light and funny moments that happen as well. Oh. I've got a fantastic one. Um, it was really, really funny. We had um, a young man from America come over and and join our community for a very short while. And it was a very short while for a very good reason. He was actually quite dangerous. He got ended up getting deported for sexually assaulting girls in a backpack. Oh, my um, gosh. But, yeah, eventually. But he came into our scene and... And um, basically caused a ruckus because we wouldn't. Eventually, we realised well, quite quickly within sort of three weeks, we realised he wasn't going to be good. It was going to go really, really wrong. And he had the blast. He put a big blast thing online about how somebody wouldn't give him a ride home or something like that. Like he was quite entitled, obviously. And um, so, and in that, he called the leader of our TNG, which is what we call the next generation, 35 and under. That was who would organise the party, who had done that sort of stuff. And um, so he blasted it all online and went, he called it the, the person who was in charge, well, not in charge, but, you know, the key focal figure, um, a cult leader and called us a cult. So we straight away, we, got, we launched into this and it was fantastic. Um we started calling uh, calling that woman uh, our, our cult leader and say, yes, grand leader, and things like that. Um, every one of the, for lack of a better term, committee, all got different roles in the cult and different parts of it. And um, we ended up having a cult-themed party, cult-themed kink party around it all as well, which was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the, one of the funniest things to come out of it. Unfortunate that that 
what happened to the other people happened, but the fact that the the whole community just sort of took it and laughed and ran with it, I think was really really cool for us. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty a pretty tight knit group of people. To a degree, um, not so tight knit that we don't welcome people, but we, uh, yeah, we are really quite close, and there's a lot of sort of sharing and play partners, I guess, around the place. And and that's absolutely fine because we know that everybody else is trusted with these people. With, with that, does does jealousy ever come up and, and become an issue? Yeah, of course. Um, of course jealousy does. Uh, I, I view jealousy a lot different to what a lot of other people do. Um, but jealousy does come as part of it. But most people in our scene realize what jealousy is and how they show jealousy and sort of try and knock it on the head pretty quickly by having the right discussions. So that, that that's really cool as well. Personally, I, I look inward whenever I feel jealous. And I did for a long time when I entered the polyamory scene and even the kink scene slightly because I was like, I want what's going on there. The part, yeah, the way that I view it is jealousy isn't a single emotion. It's almost like if you think of a brainstorm and you put jealousy in the middle, there's all sorts of different emotions that come off it, like hate, anger, sadness, you know, all of that side of things. And I like to break down why I felt jealous, what feelings were involved with that part of jealousy and how I got to that point, and then work on how I can change my reactions from there. So it's a little bit different to what most people do. But to further to your question, jealousy is a part of it, but... Because we all know each other so well, the conversations are a lot easier to have. Yeah. I think that's a great way to approach jealousy, too. Like you said, look inward to yourself and kind of figure out how to navigate it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm lucky that I've got a relatively high emotional intelligence. I know a lot about myself. And I can pick out things that I don't like about myself and and change them slightly. And this is where the, the jealousy thing came in quite significantly. Because it took me a long while to realize what it was that was actually getting me jealous. And it was more FOMO than anything else, fear of missing out, which is uh, a hatred and a, a sadness kind of thing. It's not sitting there going, I wish I had that. It's yeah. not just jealousy on its own. And so working through that, I was going there, I might not get that this time, but I might get it next time. There's no missing out here. There's nothing that I'm actually missing out on. Why do I need to be jealous? Right, and, yeah, this, this isn't that, the last time that this thing can ever happen. Right. Exactly, exactly. And it's like, oh, I wish I, you know, I wish I could play with that person or I wish I could date that person and you're sitting there going, but I might be able to down the line, there's nothing stopping that. Or I might even feel completely different just down the line and I won't want to play with them. There's nothing, you know? Right. Why get upset about something that you, that could still happen or even that you can't really control? Yeah. There's not really a point of that. And you can look inside yourself and change how you react to certain things. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've gotten a ton of great information out of you uh, for people who are interested in the kink side of things. And, I, and honestly, this is one of the the first conversations we've really had in depth about it. So we, we appreciate mm. that. Um, do you mind if, you know, before we let you go, is there any uh, tips or tricks that that you sort of learned along the way? Maybe the a key one or two that that you wish you had known on day one that that have really enhanced and really helped bring a new level of joy to the king side of things for you over the past you know couple months. Yeah. So the the first one would definitely be around. Um, realizing what your responsibilities are when you're playing with somebody. So like I said, as a dominant, the, the whole sub drop thing that I didn't know about, um, do some research around what you're doing, and that includes the sub drop and things like that. Do research. Just, if you A big kink for most people is rope. I'm not a rope person myself. I have the unfortunate mix of being both a perfectionist and impatient. If I'm not good <laughs> at it, then I, will, then I will stop doing it. Um, so I don't do rope for safety's sake. But if you're doing rope, research it, find somebody who's really good at it, learn from them and do it through that way. Go through the proper patterns. Don't think that you can, you know, you can do uh, a suspension from a roof for a full body when you've only been doing rope for two weeks. It doesn't really work that way. So do your research is, is that one. 
And even as part of that, my second point would be talk to people. Talk to people, get to know who they are, what their kinks are like, you know, because you don't know what you're like. I didn't think I would like I, I would like electro when I started, um, but it's something that came through really strongly for me, and now it's possibly my favourite thing ever. So, yeah, get out there. You, it's difficult for some people as well, but put yourself out there, I guess, to to be talked to and to talk to people and get to know your craft a little bit, I guess. It could be something that, you, like I said, you don't think you'd ever be in, but you find yourself in there and you go, shit, this is actually quite interesting. I'm, I'm going to research this. I'm going to get into this and be as safe as possible. And oh, one last point that I'll say until I'm blue in the face, enthusiastic consent is the only consent. Yeah, yes. yeah, I can't. Can't say that enough. No, I can't agree more. Ah. And I wanted Ah. to just quickly circle back to the very beginning, too, where we talked about Mm -hmm. your your aim with the podcast and and trying to get out there and talk more about consent and what's going on um, in especially education. Do you have any resources that you'd recommend in that realm, for that realm of things, that if somebody wanted to help out or wanted to do something uh, wherever they live, that they could do that? Um, yeah, there's, there are a few different things. I can't actually think of anything off the top of my head at the moment, um, but I can send them through to you so you can put them in the show notes or something like that. Okay. I'm more than happy to do that, but I can't think of them off the top of my head at the moment, no. Um, but there is heaps. You could realize it's, yeah, it's quarter past 11 at night here and my brain's starting to go. <laughs> <laughs> Completely I, I've gotta, understandable. I've be up, yeah, I've got to be up in about four and a half hours again. Ah, well, well. <laughs> We will let we'll we'll wrap it up here then. I don't want we don't want to. No, no, you're absolutely fine. I don't mind. I, I I can live on very little sleep. I'm one of those strange people. <laughs> I'm a little jealous of that actually. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, well, perfect. We'll we'll put we'll we'll get some of those resources from you, gather them up, and and put yep. them in the show notes for people, and then. In the meantime, do you mind letting people know real quick how they can find you or your show if they have any questions to follow up on? Yeah, you, you can find me basically on all your social media at the ASLUP podcast. So it's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all at the ASLUP podcast. Uh, you can email me at the ASLUP podcast at gmail.com. Um, my show is now hosted on Pepper, but you can listen on basically anything you want, Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, whatever you listen to your stuff on, you can you can listen to it through that. So, yeah, um, I do have a uh, another Q and A episode coming up, um, and I'm always welcome to to. I want to do the Q and A stuff sort of every 10, 15, 20 episodes or so. So if people do email through with questions and stuff like that, it's more than likely that I'll that I'll end up doing it in in an interview. So. Very cool. Uh, yeah, that's great to know. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for spending your time with us and staying up late. We really appreciate it. And I think we it was a great conversation about, you know, BDSM, kink, and also definitely uh, consent, which we can't mm. talk about more, enough. <laughs> yeah, no, th- thank you so much for having me on. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for getting up early to have it with me, I guess. Yeah, yeah not a problem. Absolutely. And I was just going to say, too, I think... You're going to go to sleep, and, and it's actually early enough here that I think we might go back to sleep. So, so yeah. we're, well, it's a Sunday, so we We're can. all heading off to bed for a little longer. So. Yep, that, that, that's what I'd be doing in your situation, that's for sure. I, so. I, I, I will admit I had a small nap. Oh, that's good. A little bit of just to sort of help me through. Perfect. Well, we might we might get at least one of those today. So. <laughs> So, well, thanks again, Simon, for coming on, and and we look forward to keeping in touch and and seeing where your show goes. Yeah, fingers crossed it goes where I like it, and yeah, again, thank you. All right, well, good night. Yo. (laughs) We're back. Yeah, so thank you to Simon for all of that information. 
And yeah, I don't know how else, <laughs> I don't know how else to thank somebody but say to say I thank know you. It, he stayed up really late and we had to get up really early. So thank you to Simon for making that happen, even though we were in very different time zones. We appreciate you staying up late and only getting a couple hours of sleep for work. So we had a great time talking. And next week we have Philip and Elizabeth. Yes, from. <laughs> from Twitter. They're, from Twitter, yes. They're podcast fanatics, I think. At least of our podcast. I was going to say, do you know? <laughs> I'm assuming they seem to like us. Yeah. They're awesome people. We have um, a really fascinating discussion. Yeah, it's it's actually, if I was going to dub this, if I was going to give it a nickname, it would be the parenting episode. Yeah. But I don't know that we can do that. But we, But we just did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's see everybody in a week for that. Sounds good. Bye, everyone.